Welcome back to another episode of Light Beer, Dark Money. I'm Sean Noble. And Chris is gone, but I have my lovely wife, Alyssa, here. Hello. I thought you were going to do the intro. I really wanted to. I wanted to imitate you so bad, but no, it's okay. Next time. (laughs) Next time. I mean, you still could. I'll do it next time. All right. She says that I, my intro is identical every time. Yes. I'll practice it. I'll get it, it down. Isn't it kind of supposed to be? Yeah. Okay. I think well, so. I just like to make fun of you. So. <laughs> That's true. So Chris is out. So we've now been three weeks without each other. Uh, but Chris will be back. Both Chris and I will be back next week. So we'll have a lot to catch up on. In the meantime, uh, Alyssa and I thought that we'd have a conversation about our recent trip. We just got back from Europe. And... Um, there's probably some interesting and fun tidbits, but there's also a serious component, which is we visited Normandy and the D-Day beaches, and with Memorial Day coming up and the anniversary of D-Day coming up, I thought it'd be appropriate to talk about that. Uh, but let's start with, so we traveled to, we did, we did this last year as well, we went to Europe, and we did multiple countries. This year was a little bit more intense we stayed in eight different hotels slash airbnbs slash friends houses in 13 days yeah that's a lot that's too many too many okay so so uh you know where i stand with my wife right now since <laughs> i kind of planned this um i agree part of it. <laughs> but then i reserved the right to be mad about it after the fact it was too many places to stay but it was a great trip it was a great trip um so we did uh, our our normal course going over there, because Alyssa doesn't want to do the red eye across the pond, we will... So Sean likes to give me a hard time about not wanting to do a red eye. But what he's leaving out is that I am the one that would have a toddler who doesn't get his own seat sleeping on me. So but you have the, you'd have the lay flat. We got the, we got the upgrade. So... Yes which would make it incredibly <laughs> enjoyable to have a two-year-old sleeping in an airplane seat with me. It doesn't matter how big the airplane seat is, unless next time you want to pr- fly private, I'm <laughs> yeah. totally fine with a red eye. Okay. All FYI. Right. FYI. So we fly to New York. We stay at the TWA Hotel at JFK, which we love. We love that hotel. It's just very uh, nostalgic. Yeah, it's adorable. It's yeah. It's very cool. It's a very cool. Hotel. Highly recommend that you uh, try to do that mm-hmm. at some point, even if you're not flying anywhere. Just go to. JFK. And they do day passes too. That's right. So you could go. They have a really good hotel gym. If you're somebody that cares about that, they actually have like weight racks with barbells. It's it's really nice. They have pelotons. And the and largest peloton. What did they studio? call it? Studio outside of actual peloton. I think there's like 16 or yeah. 18 bikes. Um, I've only seen one used at one, at any time <laughs> in addition to me. Um, so we stay there and then we get on the, uh, American airlines flight that leaves at nine 30 at this time of year, nine 30 AM from New York and lands in Heathrow at nine 30 or nine 40 PM. Uh, so it's a, it's a day and, uh, we stayed at uh, an airport hotel at Heathrow because I didn't think, I thought we were leaving the next day, but we actually had a day in between. So we did Tower of London. We did. We did Tower of London and then a Jurassic themed high tea. Which was good. <laughs> I really like to plan themed teas while we're in London. Last time we were there, we did uh, Willy Wonka and the Charlotte Fa- Chocolate Factory yes. theme, right? Mm-hmm. That's good. Then we went on to, uh, we caught a flight from Heathrow to Nice and then went over to, is it pronounced Con? I was actually Kings? just about to do a confession that my goal while we were there was to figure out how to pronounce it. And I didn't. <laughs> so we were in the place where the film festival takes place in <laughs> France for Three day, four day, three, three and a half days. days. Um, and I still don't, I still say con 
but with a question mark instead of an S <laughs> at the end. And I, I really failed. That was my one goal for going there. Yeah. So that part of the trip was probably the least, uh, I don't know how to, it wasn't bad, but it was. The weather wasn't great. No, weather I can was, imagine that is a really nice place to be when the weather is nice, but it also would have been a lot busier. Right. Um, we definitely spent a lot of time walking around in the rain, but we went to St. Marguerite Island, which is about a 15 minute ferry ride from Con question mark. And, um, that is where the man in the iron mask was imprisoned, which w I didn't think I cared about that, but I really do care about it now, especially <laughs> since I can learn more about it via Leonardo DiCaprio. Right. So now we're going to watch that movie. Yes. Um, I was most interested in the fact that it was a important uh, place for Roman trade, merchant trade, in the turn of, this, of the, you know, like before Christ, BC. Which that was the... not a takeaway of mine whatsoever. Hmm. Interesting. Well, that was one of my takeaways. <laughs> so. Uh, but it's it's really interesting to be places where things are so old that, you know, they're, they're 2,000 plus years old. I mean, it just is amazing to me. Yeah, it's hard to wrap your brain around sometimes. Yeah. Um, we also went to a Michelin star restaurant, which did not turn out very well. Yes. If you want advice for traveling with toddlers, near the top of the list, I would put don't take them to Michelin star restaurants. They <laughs> don't care and they're not going to like it. Um, but it turns out I was the biggest toddler of them all because <laughs> I thought the food was disgusting. I wouldn't eat it. The kids were actually fine. Yeah. Uh, the kids had, they, we ordered them uh, a filet and then who's almost two plowed through almost all of it. Yes. Ate Reagan's portion. Yeah. He did better than I did. <laughs> but um, actually, I do want to talk about tips for traveling with toddlers because I was thinking about it today um, because I knew I was coming here and I coined an acronym okay. for traveling with kids and it is excess. This is my advice for traveling with children. Excess, which would be exposure, which is doing it just over and over, even if it really sucks um, some of the time. And sleep, committing to keeping sleep schedules as close to normal as you can. Maybe if you feel like it's appropriate, bringing melatonin gummies, which I'm not ashamed to admit I used. Um, and then liberal use of my favorite things while traveling, which are snacks, sugar, and screen time. <laughs> and I think with those five things... You can travel with kids, and I know that it's a really scary thing, and a lot of parents build it up in their mind a lot, but I think the first part, exposure, is the most important part, just doing it over and over, and so it's not really a thing. And I was thinking about um, the flight home was 11 hours, which is a long time. Everybody was kind of over it, but the kids didn't have any meltdowns or anything like that, and now an hour-long flight or a two-hour-long flight, like we wouldn't even think about it. It's right. nothing, so yeah. we've just had so much exposure that well and i think that that's uh, for for whatever reason um i well i think it's because prior to covid i traveled a lot for work and we like to travel anyway um we uh, reagan traveled with us i mean she went on 30 plus flights before she turned one year old uh, so she was very used to it and then we got vin into it once we started traveling after COVID again. And so I don't know how many flights he's been on, but I don't know 20, either, but it's funny. I actually wouldn't say I love traveling. I know you love traveling. I like to have traveled and I do <laughs> like when I am places, I'm happy that I did it. But the lead up, like I, I was telling people at the foundry when they're asking about my trip, I'm like, part of my process is that I spend the week before very angry about the trip so I'm angry that I have to pack. I'm angry that we have to disrupt our routines. I'm angry that we have all this planning to do. I spend the week before really upset. And then I come back and I tell everybody 
how amazing it is. But that's just that's part of my process for traveling. But um, I was thinking about it while we were traveling that I feel like your ancestors did migrate, right? That is part yeah. of your. I don't. I don't think mine had a good experience migrating <laughs> because <laughs> I feel like my sentiments toward travel are embedded deep in my DNA that I just I dread it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I, mine must have been happy with moving along because my great 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 whatever how many very many greats grandfather on my dad's side came from england in 1650 to america um and then on my mom's side they came in the late 1800s so yeah Scannels and Martin Ukes are a little bit newer to America, <laughs> but I don't think our travels were as successful as yours because I definitely... Because you have anxiety about it. Yeah, I do. It. Well, and I mean, it is interesting. I, I appreciate your, your tips on traveling with toddlers because uh, I think the exposure part of it is important. I mean, we were on a flight. I think it was when we were flying from Stuttgart, Germany back to London that... Uh, there was a couple, young couple with a baby that started crying. You could tell they were really like uncomfortable with the situation. And, mm -hmm. and I was kind of like, you know, it's going to happen. You know, don't worry about it. Right. And here's what I say to people who have young children. They're like, oh, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to disrupt it. It's like, no, that's it. People who go on flights have the responsibility of being prepared for whatever is going to be on that flight. And if you don't have noise canceling headphones, that's your fault. If you don't want to hear crying baby, then bring your nose noise canceling headphones. Yeah. And also just don't be a jerk. Yeah. Like kids are kids are kids They're going right. to cry. So, although I don't, well, let's see. What did, did you think about that baseball player and hit speaking up about his wife being forced to clean up the popcorn? That her kids spilled. I, I'm torn about that. I am too. But after spending 13 days traveling with kids, I'm gonna go ahead and side with the mom. <laughs> well, I mean, I try to clean up a little bit around. Yeah, of course. But if they spill popcorn on the floor that you know there's right. not much you can do about that i try to be as considerate as possible and clean up but if i were pregnant and forced by a flight attendant to get down on the floor and clean up yeah, popcorn i probably would that's pretty outrageous be a little um, upset I, generally flight attendants are great when it comes to traveling with kids they're helpful i remember during covid with the mask situation most of the time there were some, uh, one instance, I think, where we had a flight attendant who was really outrageous about a two-year-old wearing a mask. But uh, for the most part, I think that they got it. Um, the only, we we didn't have a great experience on the flight back, and I'll, I guess that was probably my flight, my fault. You guys suppose you can Oh, me I, out on I that. don't really want to talk about that. <laughs> We just I were, you were, we were all split Sean. up around the plane and it was a little bit challenging, but I mean, it's not, it's also not the, the airline staff's um, responsibility to keep family dynamic, keep, you know. Right. But the idea that you're in business and I'm in premium economy and they they tell you, you can't go back there is ridiculous. I mean, it's one thing for me from premium economy not to go into business. I get that. But, you know, we traded seats or whatever. Yes. I think feel like this is boring, though, oh, to talk right. about. Okay. I don't know. Maybe your listeners can uh, can write in and say they want to <laughs> hear the story of why I, Alyssa started crying on <laughs> the flight home. I cry, I did cry more than both kids. Yeah, I was going to say, the, <laughs> neither of the kids because had a problem. they didn't cry at all. <laughs> I did cry, but that was the culmination of 13 days of travel. But yeah. Anyways, we were in con. We were in con. And uh, I, look, we, we, we talked about how it is a cross between Miami Beach and New Orleans. Yeah. Um, because the, the 
I can't remember the name of the street that borders the ocean, but that has all the hotels that look like, you know, for the most part, could be very Miami Beach-ish. We stayed in a hotel that looked, it was right out of the 80s, all mirrors and silver. And, you know, you hear the theme of Miami Vice <laughs> as you walk up. <laughs> for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, you go one street up, and it's New Orleans. because And so you really get a sense. That's the first time I really had a sense of, wow, the influence of France on New Orleans is real. Um, you know, these buildings that have... Did you think people were lying? No, I just, <laughs> I hadn't really thought about it, you know. You, <laughs> but but you see the buildings that have, the, all, they all have balconies and the lattice, mm -hmm. you know, and all that kind of stuff. It just yeah. was like, you could totally see a Mardi Gras You thought New parade. Orleans copied Disney? <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> no, it was the other way around. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then from Cannes, we went on to, well, we flew to Paris, rented a big, big van, and it was a... A nine-seater stick shift. Nine-seater stick shift. I haven't driven a stick shift in more than 20 years, maybe 30. Well, let me think about this. I you think the last, at the least, I think the last time I drove a stick shift was in 1989. Holy crap. That was a long time ago. Um, I only stalled twice. Hmm. Was it more than twice? I think so. I think it was like three or four times, but you did a great job. <laughs> you did a great job. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but it was very interesting. Uh, we drove and I mean, driving through the French countryside was beautiful. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Um, and it's actually really beautiful because of rapeseed yeah which they use to make canola oil and i've always thought of that as like very bad you don't want those things in your body but it turns out driving through fields of it is very peaceful and very gorgeous yeah it's very yellow yeah and so there's green and then big yellow patches yeah, and the it contrast was, is beautiful yeah it was very nice um we stayed in we stayed the night so we drove to rowan i think is how you say it r-o-u-e-n it is where Joan of Arc was burned at the stake, tried and burdened at the stake. Uh, we stayed in a hotel that used to be a castle, uh, which was pretty awesome, and then visited the uh, the site of where Joan of Arc was burned and martyred, and then also went to the church where she had the trial, I guess. Um, pretty amazing history there. That was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and then went on to Normandy. We'll come back to that. Oh, no, we went to Mont Saint Michel. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that. I didn't even know that existed. So I'm um, grateful that you. Mont Saint Michel was founded 600, 700, and it was a monastery built in honor and apparently at the request of the Archangel Michael. And it is pretty breathtaking it is out on an island and it's a massive stone structure well it's an entire town yes which i was astounded by it's also yeah, the it's place where cool. our almost two-year-old ate a <laughs> double scoop pistachio <laughs> ice cream cone like it was the last thing he was ever going to eat in his life i mean i could not believe the kid down the whole freaking thing it was remarkable. We did the double scoop because I thought he'd have a little bit, then I'd get the rest. But nope, he ate the whole damn thing. He opted for diabetes instead. <laughs> yes, but if you find yourself in France, I think Mont Saint Michel is a must see. Yeah, absolutely, astounding, and amazing um, experience. Uh, then went on to Normandy. Uh, a, what was it? Camp. Grand Camp Maisie. Grand Camp Maisie. Um, like I said, we'll come back to that. Uh, then went back to Rowan mm -hmm. uh, on our way back to Paris, where we then caught a train to Stuttgart, Germany, to visit Abby and Matt. Markham, our good friends who are based in Stuttgart. 
Uh, Abby used to work with us, and uh, it's been and they we visited them last year when we went to Europe, and it was a blast. And so we did the same thing. It's just a great way to end the trip. Yes, our children live their very best lives on military bases, and I <laughs> wish I could. I wish I could offer that to them all the time, but I mean, alas, you could probably join the military. Could I? I don't know. I don't think so. I don't know. I think the recruitment's down. <laughs> you might be able to get in. <laughs> They're looking. The for question is whether thirty-nine-year-old mothers of <laughs> two. <laughs> I don't know. Well, I, they need some fitness instructing, some wellness, some breath work, all the all the things. You have a lot to offer. Um, I mean, those guys could use some life coaching. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, we were there during the coronation, meaning we were in Germany during the coronation of Ch King Charles mm -hmm. in England, which allowed us to see things kind of in real time rather than being up in the middle of the night or reading about it the next day. Mm -hmm. um, and it, one thing that it struck has, has struck me as, so the, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world that, that we didn't really pay that much attention to because we were traveling. But, you know, in the last few days, Trump has been found guilty of at least sexual assault um, by jury and, and ruled to uh, ordered to pay five million dollars to this woman. Um, and the thing that is astounding to me is that he can do something like that, and the people who su support him will just ignore it. It's like, or mm -hmm. it, it actually emboldens them even more. Right. And what I have concluded is that they live in the wrong country. <laughs> they are monarchists. Mm hmm. Because they believe in a person rather than a position. And it, it, it is not constitutional and it's really frustrating. And I, you know, I, I'm of the mind that he's likely to get the nomination and he's probably going to beat Biden because Biden is so terrible. that You really think? I think so. Wow. I guess I hadn't considered it. I, I mean. I just hadn't thought that far because I don't want to. Well, yeah. But it was, but so you, you have a, a figurehead in, in King Charles in England, and I think you put it, we, we talked about this earlier today, what, how did you say it? That, oh, that, well, it's the people that support Trump, no matter what, are worse than monarchists, because at least the people that are dedicated to the monarchy in the UK know that it's a ceremonial position. Yeah. And I'm not saying that King Charles has no power, but he certainly is not the president of the United States. That's a lot more consequential. Right. And, and, and you should take into account things that a person is accused of or found guilty of. and Character. Right. Yeah. So frustrating. Right. So, um, and then we had our 11-hour flight back, which... I guess we'll talk about later. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take requests if we'll anybody requests actually wants to hear about that. Why, why Alyssa was crying. Um, so let's go back to Normandy. So here we are a few days before Memorial Day. We're a few weeks, a couple of weeks, three weeks away from the anniversary of D-Day. Um, Normandy has been on my bucket list for, you know, my whole life, um, basically. Uh, certainly since... The mid '80s. Uh, I remember when Reagan spoke. You had a bucket list before the mid '80s. Yeah. Hmm. That's impressive. <laughs> it's, okay. It's on brand for you. I didn't have. <laughs> I didn't have a bucket. I didn't have a bucket list before I was 15. That's for sure. Yeah, I've been. I've been. I actually don't have a bucket list until I do something, and then I say, "Oh yeah, that was on my bucket list." I mean, my time travel bucket list has existed since I was 10 and 1955 has been on that. Okay. That's different. How's it different? Cause that's not a real bucket list. No. Oh. Well, unless, <laughs> unless time travel becomes real. Well, it is kind of, well, all right. You're right. Anyway. So 
the um, Reagan Reagan speaking in 1984 at the 40th anniversary of D-Day uh, to me was uh, very impactful. And, and since that time, I've wanted to, to go to see the beaches of Normandy and Point to Hawk. And, um, and thank goodness we, we went when we did because the week prior, half of Point to Hawk fell into the sea and they don't expect, or at least the gentleman we spoke to doesn't expect it to last very much longer a year is that right is that what we said as we said yeah so we had an amazing tour guide um a uh, british gentleman who is it was a commando he was a special forces 20 some years um and uh live now lives in uh france in the normandy region um but he has met and interviewed and talked to you know, dozens of veterans of, of the D-Day experience and knows just so many remarkable <laughs> stories about these gentlemen and women. And um, there was just something really inspiring about standing on the top of the cliffs at Point to Hawk and, and looking at what they did and what they went through. Um, and then keeping in mind what, what Reagan said, and I, I actually pulled up this, the speech. I read it a couple times this morning. I don't think I'll be able to get through much of it, but I figured I would at re- least read. Because of time or because you're going to cry? I'm going to cry. Okay. <laughs> I'm already <upset. laughs> So, um, but uh, the, the line that is always stuck He out is already me. crying in case... <laughs> In case the listeners can't tell. Well, and, and we took a picture at the memorial, and and um, and Reagan talked about that. He, well, at first he says, uh, oh, thank you, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> I will need the tissues. So he starts by saying, "Here we, we're here to mark the day in history when the Allied peoples joined in a battle to reclaim this continent to liberty. Um, for four long years, Long years, much of Europe had been under the terrible, under a terrible shadow. Free nations had fallen. Jews cried out in the camps. Millions cried out for liberation. Europe was enslaved, and the world prayed for its rescue. Here in Normandy, the rescue began. Um, he talks about the 225 rangers who jumped off the British landing craft, uh, ran to the bottom of these cliffs, and their mission was challenging and difficult. I mean, they had to climb the sheer cliffs to take out these enemy guns that were necessary to, to allow the, the rest of the invasion to happen. Um, and he says, behind me is the memorial that symbolizes the ranger daggers that were thrust into the top of these cliffs. And before me, are, <sighs> sorry, are the men who put them there. These are the boys of Point to Hawk. These are the men who took to the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free a continent. These are the heroes who helped end the war. And it just, to be there was, um, it's just really powerful. It was. Why don't we take a moment of silence for Peggy Noonan's amazing writing? (laughs) No kidding. (laughs) Sorry, I just needed to lighten it up a little bit. Um, Thank you, Peggy. Yes. No, her words were... Perfect, um, and delivered perfectly by right. the great communicator, um, who who brought it all alive. But imagine the power of standing there in front of the men who did this. Oh. It just uh, it makes you realize how much we have to be appreciative for the blessings of liberty. Yes, especially because when you really think about it and we watch some interviews of the veterans, um, and I mean this in the most complimentary way ever, but they weren't they weren't extraordinary people by nature. They were forced into that situation. I'm sure many, most, did not want to be there. They They just had to because they stepped up. Right. 
and they had to do it. And um, dang it. <laughs> no, I don't. It's okay. Um, but they did what they did what needed to be done. Right. And they were regular people asked to do an extraordinary thing. Yeah. Yeah. Ordinary people asked to do the extraordinary. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that even, even the most, the, those in, in America that have the most love of freedom and liberty don't think about this as much as we probably should, um, about what it, what it took and, um, and why this was important, um, that, that we were a liberating force. We weren't an occupying force. We mm -hmm. were there to liberate and, and why that was important, uh, for the, for the entire trajectory of freedom in the world and not just the United States. Yeah, and it was really moving to see that the people of that area, it in the area itself, is kind of a, a living memorial yeah. to the to forces into, that liberated them. Right. That they're to this day more grateful than we are here because, yeah, we don't have the visual, physical reminders. We don't have the um, bomb holes. We don't have blood literally still on the pews of churches right. from their makeshift hospitals. Like the blood stains are still there. Well, and the bullet holes in, yeah. the, in the doorways yeah. um, and in the, in the churches from the fights that were, you we're know, so from lucky the, here that yeah. we don't, we, yeah, we haven't had that kind of a situation. Um, and it is, uh, it's a beautiful thing that, that, the people of France still honor our men and women who... Yeah, we were... We heard... Our tour guide told us that every year on the anniversary, they have... I don't remember how many paratroopers. They do um, like a reenactment right. in one of the one of the towns, right? I, I don't even remember the town now. I think it was St. Marie Eglise. Or yeah. Something. Where they have paratroopers. Yeah. Fly in. They have like 40,000 people. That yeah, come it's to, a huge, to watch it. it's a huge celebration. Um, but it's, and it's interesting that, you know, to, to be in the churches and to see like, because obviously it, the windows were blown out, shot out, whatever. Um, a lot of these stained glass windows have been replaced with, with imagery of the paratroopers mm -hmm. and, yeah. and the men and women who were there to liberate France. Yeah, well, the United States paid for the, the Marines paid for the stained glass oh, replacement. Oh, that's right. That was a, a gift, gift to the town. Yeah. Was they paid for the Think stained glass. Think of that. The, the 101st and the 82nd paid. Yeah. To, to the, you know, the very place that they liberated. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that was a powerful Probably the highlight of our trip, at least for me. Yeah, it was very special. For your dad. Mm -hmm. he, that was on his bucket list, too. So um, if you've not been to see uh, Point de Hoc or Omaha Beach or Utah Beach, Normandy, uh, highly, highly recommend and if you do go, let me know or let Alyssa know. We'll yeah. put you in touch with the guy who was our tour guide. Yeah. Uh, he was absolutely amazing. Um, well worth it, 100%. Uh, worth going back and doing it again. Mm -hmm. uh, no question. So, um, well, I think that's probably a good place to wrap up. Because we want to have let people yeah, think we'll about Yeah, we'll end Memorial crying Day. just like <laughs> our trip ended with me <laughs> sobbing on an airplane. So, <laughs> Well, um, I wasn't sobbing. I no, just cried I, a little I, bit. No, I just cried a little bit, right? The, uh, with Memorial Day coming up, 
say a prayer for the veterans, find somebody, thank them, visit a graveside. Yeah, you know, know, I was thinking, I actually, I, I need to find out. I don't know if my grandfather ever went. He traveled a lot. He and my grandmother traveled a lot. I don't know if they ever went to Normandy. He was not there on D-Day, but he did serve. Oh, he was in the Pacific, right? Yeah. He was on a submarine, but I'm sure he would have loved to see it if he didn't already. So I need I need to find out if he did. Yeah. Well, we can go back again on his behalf mm-hmm. in proxy. Yeah. So, all right. Well, folks, appreciate the freedom and liberty that we have. And thank, thank those who've served to defend it, to provide it. Um, it's nothing more important. And uh, we live in the greatest country in the world. There's just no question about it in my mind. So with that, have a good one. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye.